All right, so let's jump right in then. And um, this video is going to be on working in Adobe Camera Raw for the white balance, or excuse me, the basic editing uh, assignment two. Um, and so we're going to be talking about the HSL uh, panel, the split toning panel, the lens corrections panel, the effects panel, and the crop tool. Um, we've already covered the basic panel, the tone curve, and the detail panel. So um, let's just jump right in. For this assignment, you guys should download the resource files. There are two uh, subfolders. One is called edits. One is called originals. Um, the edits, just like before, are my finished images that I want you guys to try and replicate. So if we jump over to the originals here, let's go ahead and just open those right up into Photoshop, which will launch Adobe Camera Raw. Okay, so um, what I would have you guys do is to then pull up the individual images right next door so you guys can compare and contrast your edits with mine, trying to replicate my edits as best as you can. Um, but let's take a look here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just get a good solid base, um, which is what I expect you guys to do. Uh, but you're going to be looking when you do this um, at my edited image trying to match it. So I'm just going to go by my eye. Um, which would probably get us pretty close to the finished edit that I'm showing you. So we'll get the white balance going. So somewhere in there I think looks good for that. We'll then go jump in to the exposure, get ourselves a nice exposure. Um, and then add the contrast in here. And remember with the contrast, we're separating out the midtones, we're pushing darks to the blacks and highlights to the whites, creating uh, more contrast in our image. It helps our subject generally to stand out more. So we always want to be adding that, that contrast. Highlight shadows and whites we're only doing when necessary. So we'll go down to the blacks. Just gonna push those blacks so I get a nice rich tonal range in my image. And let's come in here and push a little bit of the vibrance up. All right, so we're getting pretty close. I'm going to jump in now with um, the sharpening. We'll zoom in here on our subjects. And we'll give a good amount of sharpening here. I don't need to do the noise reduction here. My ISO is not too high. There's not a lot of grain. Um, and then lastly, let's zoom back out and jump over to the tone curve. Remember in the tone curve we're dealing with parametric tone curves or point tone curves um, and remember we're asking you guys to just pretty much forget about the parametric tone curve since it deals with sliders and the point tone curve allows a lot more control. Um, in this case uh, we're going to be sliding up the bottom where the black point starts to kind of give us that faded look. And I can look in the shadow areas here and here really watching those blacks and seeing how that's affecting my image overall. But then that looks pretty good. And now we can jump on to um, these new panels. Um, and so let's look first at the HSL and grayscale panel, which is right here. So HSL stands for Hue, Saturation, and Luminance. Uh, we'll start right here with Luminance. And you need to remember Luminance is the perceived brightness of a color to the human observer. So um, as we change these sliders, and the colors as they relate to the picture will change the brightness of them. So let's change uh, the greens, for example. So we should start to see these greens in the foreground start to change. So you can see as I drag the green luminous slider down, their perceived brightness goes down with them. Okay. Um, we don't use this too much, uh, but know that that tool is there for you to use. We also then have saturation. Um, and just like saturation in the basic panel, um, it's doing the same thing, except for in the basic panel when we slide the, uh, the saturation slider, we're affecting all of the color channels at once, whereas here, we're affecting the individual color channels. Um, so we have a little bit more precise control of what is being saturated. So again, if I want to saturate the green tones, I'm gonna just going to come over to the green slider and drag that up and you can see that the green tones become more saturated, those colors become more rich. Okay, and then hue. This is a kind of an important one actually now though uh, because um, 
you can really start to modify your image here. Uh, one way I really like to use this is something like this. When I have these green tones in an image, um, and I want them, let's say, to be a little bit more green, I can simply drag those with the green slider, and you can see those become a lot richer looking in color. Okay, so that is the HSL, or the Hue Saturation Luminance, uh, part of this tab. The second part of this tab is the Convert to Grayscale checkbox. Um, and there's actually a few ways that we can actually convert this to a black and white. This is the most precise, not always the one we're going to use, but we'll take a look at that in a second. This is the most precise way to create a black and white. So you can see if I check that box, the image goes to grayscale and we're left with a set of defaults for each of the color channels. Now I can modify each of the color channels individually here to get a very precise black and white image, which is really good if I'm only doing it on one image. However, if I want to apply this to several edits, um, and save time, this isn't the best way to do it because this is going to be a really specific black and white um, to this image. Instead what I would do there is I would come over back to my basic panel, I would desaturate all the way, and I would start to bring in contrast more and possibly push my blacks a little more to create a really full and rich black and white image. Now I'm going to hit Command Z to step out of those edits. Um, so those are the two different ways we can create black and whites. Remember basic tone black and white or basic tab black and white is going to be really good to apply to a really wide range of photos if we want to sync those up. The convert to grayscale option is really great if we want a really precise black and white on an individual image. Alright, so moving on we've got split toning and when we're split toning you can basically think about this as we're going to add a color to the highlights and we're going to add a color to the shadows. Um, so we're changing those from black and white to a color. Um, and we can kind of use these different sliders to move that around. So let's take a look. I'm going to change the hue of my highlights to a yellow color, a yellow-orange. And you can see right now I didn't do anything because that color is completely desaturated. So we need to increase the saturation. And now normally you would do this very mildly, but for effect, I'm going to do it a little bit stronger so you guys can see. So you can see we've got a really warm tone in the highlights now, kind of taking over the picture. Um, and so let's kind of um, contrast that with a cool tone, some blues, in the shadows. Again, we don't see it because we, the color is desaturated, so we need to increase the saturation. So now you can see we've got an even balance between where the blacks, or the blues in this case, the shadows start, and where the highlights, the yellow color, starts. It's balanced, so it's even on both sides. We can push this towards the shadows, which is going to introduce more of that blue into our image and less of this yellow. Or we can push it towards the highlight, and decrease the amount of blues and increase the amount of yellows. Okay, so after we dial that in, we'll need to adjust our balance between the highlights and shadows there to dial in just the right color. This part tends to be pretty tricky for a lot of people when they're getting started, so pay close attention to the highlight color in my edits as you're going through these images so you can make sure you capture these just right. I'm just going to double click to reset these and go back to a normal image. Okay, that is split toning. Let's take a look next at lens correction. And so when we're talking lens correction, um, you see we've got manual, color, and profile tabs along the top. We'll start in the manual and we'll work our way down. So depending on the lens that you have, we can correct for distortion um, either in the actual lens itself or in the angle that you took the image at. Um, so we can correct for distortion here depending on the lens that you used. Um, we can correct if you're um, taking a picture of a tall building. We can correct for that here. And same way here, if you're photographing along the side of a building and you're not perfectly parallel to it, we can correct for that here. Um, scale and rotate, we're going to kind of ignore those because we're going to fix those with the crop tool later, which we'll look at in a little bit. Um, vignetting is the most important one here. And the manual vignette is going to be the best option. Um, and the vignette is going to do just what it sounds like. It's going to either brighten or darken the edges of our photo, adding um, interest to our subject, adding visual uh, interest to our subject, helping us to lead the, the viewer's eye to our main point of interest. Okay, um, moving right along, we have color. Um, and I'm actually going to probably go to a different image to show you this. Um, so when we have an image, I'm going to zoom way in here. When we have an image um, where we have something um, 
darker in color against something bright. We tend to have, especially with a cheaper lens, um, so I don't have much of it here because I have a pretty nice lens that I use for this picture, but with uh, you know a kit lens or something like that, you're gonna see a lot more of this. Um, but you have, when you have those two contrasts, you tend to get something called chromatic aberration. Um, and it, let me zoom in even more here so we can see a little bit better. Um, what it is, is a discoloration around those um, contrasting edges. So you can see around the top here, top of Z, there is blue. There's a blue highlight there with a little bit of purple back here and some red tones right here. Okay, so we need to um, turn this on. We'll do this kind of automatic removal of the chromatic aberration. And you can see it started to do that. But what we need to do then is increase the amounts of uh, the defringe here. Um, and you can see we have the purple blue slider here and the green uh, kind of yellow red slider here. So we're going to move these sliders all around and we'll take a look at that now. Um, so let's tackle the blue up top. So we have the, the amount, how much the effect is being applied here, and we have the tonal ranges or the hues that it's being applied to here. So first what I'll do is I'll drag this up and you can see that as I do that, that blue line has now disappeared. It's totally gone. If I drag this to include less tones, so now you can see we're not including any blue tones in that amount that we're adding. It's not removing it. And watch now as I drag this down to include the blue tones, we can see that disappear. Okay, so that's now gone from our image. The image is looking better. We still have a little bit of this red here we need to deal with. So now I can drag this up to include more red tones, and now that's gone. Okay, so this image now looks pretty good. Um, that's all we're looking to do is just to slightly remove those chromatic aberrations in our photograph. Put this back into fit into view, and let's jump back to our other photograph. <clears throat> the last step here is this profile. We're typically going to forget this. The profile tab here is kind of an automatic when we enable that, you can see that the, it reads the metadata of the actual image we're working on, and it sees that I shot this with a Canon lens, specifically a Canon 50mm 1.2. Um, and so what it does is it knows that lens's profile for distortion, for vignetting, and everything, and it tries to correct. The problem is I feel like it doesn't give us as much control. So I tend to actually like how that looks better versus that. So if you're doing a large batch of images, and really there's no reason to do that. We can sync, we can batch process, we should be using manual. Um, but no, this is here and if for some reason you want to use it. But basically we're always going to be using manual and color lens corrections. Okay, bear with me, we're, we're, we're closing in now, we're almost there. Um, the last thing we're going to deal with is effects. And so um, the first part of that is the amount of grain so we can actually add in green to our image. So you see as I slide this up, we introduce green to our image. Personally, my, my preference and taste is to not include that. Um, actually, I do everything in my power to get rid of green. Um, but some people think it's kind of an artistic thing they, they really like, and it can be a taste thing. So if you want to include some green in your image, you definitely can do that here. You can not only include the amount, but the size of the green, as well as the roughness of the grain. And turn that off. Um, secondly, this part's really important, and it's post-crop vignette. And so before we take a look at that, what we're going to do is take a look at the crop tool. So up here at the top, so we've got a few different tools. We're talking specifically about the crop tool. We want to make sure this is set to normal, but you can see that we also can constrain proportions to different custom um, aspect ratios. So I'll go to normal. And what that's going to allow me to do is to kind of freeform my crop. I do want to pay attention when I'm freeforming my crop. I want to make sure that I'm keeping um, a pretty close eye on the aspect ratio. I don't want to change it too much from what it originally was. Because later on, when I go to sell this to a client, it's going to limit what they can buy. So, but let's just say real quick, we're keeping that same aspect ratio. And let's just say I think that looks good. I'll commit that change by hitting return. Okay. So if we go back to lens corrections now and down to vignetting, you can see as I drag this 
there's not much of an effect. And because it's still applying that effect to the outside corners, even though they're not there anymore. And that's the argument, that's the reasoning for why we need post crop vignette. So now when I add vignetting, it's going to add that vignette from the new cropped corners. And if you crop in on an image a good amount, you really need to do this to add like a legitimate look of a real lens to your image, otherwise it tends to look cropped. So what I like to do to get this at looking as accurate as possible is I actually like to drag this way down, make it dark so we can see it, and then drag the feather all the way off. And now we have a nice hard line where we can see where we're applying this vignette. We can see then what midpoint does really easily, and we can see what roundness does really easily. Okay, so I like something about like that. I don't like to affect my image too much, just real subtle. Um, and then I will bring back in, double click to reset the, the feather to the default. And then now I can decide how much I want. Just slightly, something like that probably. And that brings us to the post crop vignette. That's why we do that. Um, and I, I believe we did crop. Oh, one last thing. Um, let's take a look. Let's just bring up an image here. So um, the last thing next to the crop tool, we have this bubble level, the leveling tool. And what we need to do is if your image is crooked, this tool will straighten it. And so we need to look at the horizon line or something in the photograph that should be perfectly horizontal. And then we just click and drag along that line. And you can see mine was just ever so slightly, so I'll hit return to commit that change. And hopefully you saw that rotate. Just for effect, I'm going to drag this off kilter so you can see it move. Okay, so this tool is meant to actually level the image. Um, my picture was already level, so it didn't do too much. But if you took a picture that was canted on accident, you could use that tool to straighten it right out and get it perfectly straight. Um, that is everything that we're doing for this editing assignment number two. I want you guys to download those resource files, um, watch this video, and um, try and get your pictures to look as close as possible to mine while remembering all the things we talked about um, previously for the editing assignment number one. All right, that's it.